Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Um, so, this is Andy Wilman, executive producer of uh, the Grand Tour, formerly Top Gear. Um, and just by way of introduction, um, as I've got to know Andy a little bit in the preparation for this, I can honestly say he's a very modest, uh, down-to-earth uh, individual, given his, in his achievements. Um, and it's been very hard for us to find time to do this because he's been completing the third series of the Grand Tour while we've been getting ready to do this. But I just wanted, before we talk to him, I just want to look back at his career a little bit. So if we look at Top Gear, uh, it was a show with incredibly humble origins. It was originally the BBC's motoring show, launched in its later format by Andy and Jeremy Clarkson in 2002. Uh, it was shown in 214 territories, had viewership of 350 million, um, and is estimated to have made 150 million pounds a year for BBC Worldwide. Which we didn't get, just saying. <laughs> yeah. It was the world's biggest non-fiction uh, television show. And interestingly, uh, of the audience, 52% were male, 48% were female. It made its three presenters truly global megastars uh, that most TV personalities can only start to dream about. At its height, James May, Richard Hammond, and of course Jeremy Clarkson were truly global megastars. Household names from Mogadishu to Santiago, Slovakia to Sydney. Aspects of the show entered popular culture and it spawned a number of international versions. It's a profile unequaled by any other television show globally. What can even come close? There was then the notorious uh, transition to the Grand Tour, which attracted worldwide publicity from perhaps the world's most established and traditional media owner to the fastest growing and potentially most radical with the transition to Amazon. Um, it was a big step which had much bigger budget, budgets, an online streaming format and, and the Grand Tour was Amazon's most watched premiere uh, with a launch episode called The Holy Trinity. It was the number one stream show worldwide, number one in the UK, Germany, Sweden, and Japan, number three in the United States. It also had the distinction of being the most illegally downloaded show on the planet. Yeah, it um, did. So Andy- That's it's everybody here who's techie. <laughs> okay. Who's like, yeah, I'm gonna nick it, thanks. I wanted to ask you one question about Top Gear before yeah. we start. Um, I mean, we've seen how hard Top Gear is to recreate. The BBC are on their third iteration with a, with a group of new presenters. Yeah. Um, it was a very special show. I mean, it was huge. And it evolved from having its roots in a very traditional car show. Mm -hmm. How did the idea for the format you launched in 2002, which we've seen in some ways continue with the Top Gear, uh, with the Grand Tour. How did that evolve? Where did it come from? Well, um, the person I've got to big up the most on that is Jeremy, because although he's known as a sort of boy, uh, you know, very boisterous TV presenter, he's actually a print journalist at heart. So he's very, he's very sort of focused on attention span and, uh, you know, editing himself and stuff like that. So all the light bulb moments that we came up with to reinvigorate the show were kind of his. But um, on top of that, where we got lucky, I think, was we never set out to make a big global show. We just set out to make a, a better show than the one that existed. So if you've got someone like Simon Cowell or um, Burnett, they will sit down and they will devise the X Factor they will devise The Apprentice and they'll devise it to be a world beater. And they'll have a strong format that you can sell to other countries. And we never did that. Ours just kind of developed organically. And a lot of the things that happened were just a happy accident. Like uh, for those of you who knew the old show, we had a racing driver called The Stig who never spoke. And um, the reason we did that is because racing drivers are too stupid to talk. And we couldn't actually find one that's got anything to say. So we were like, actually, why bother? Just like stick him in a helmet and he's done. And we made these big specials around the world. But again, they were an accident that we kind of would film too much stuff. So we weren't clever enough to devise something grand, yeah. but we were clever enough to go, yeah, that works. Let's stick with it. 
But the organic side of that development meant that the show has had a longer life. Yes. Because you're not relying on the format. Yeah. You're relying on the content. So I like to think of it as like a band making albums. You know, we have a sound, but each new show is like a new album. And there'll be hit songs, decent songs, experimental ones that don't work. You know, the whole mixture. You'll have hits yeah. and misses. But that's, that's sort of nub of it. Okay. Well, it's been incredibly successful. So the transition to Amazon. Yeah. Um, why did you choose Amazon or why did they choose you? And how did you pitch to Amazon? Was it a, was it a quick decision? Uh, how, how, did it, how did it come about? We're not great. Oh, us lot pitching, I'll tell you. It was, um, okay, so we wanted to, if we wanted to carry on working together, we, wanted, we needed to be in a place where we could make our own show. We needed editorial freedom because we'd always had that. And by editorial freedom, I mean, if you go to certain broadcasters, they have a tone. They will make you make a show that fits their channel. Whereas Amazon and Netflix, it's a platform. Yeah. It's just a platform. You make the stuff, they put it out. So we knew in the back of our minds that the new world, which it was to us then, was where we'd have to go. But we didn't know how to get there. So, and we'd lived in a bubble at the BBC for so long. So we got um, an agent in America and he's like, who watches Entourage? You know, like Ari Gold. He's like him. He never shuts up. And he was like, and we got, we, we used to have our first video conference foot calls, which I'm sure you guys have had lots of. We've never had a video conference and we never knew it was on. So we'd be like in our room in London going, when is that twat going to come and, uh, oh, hi, Lance. And he was like, <laughs> and then we'd start talking to him. And, um, he drove us along with all the deals and everything. And then we had to go and meet Amazon, the big execs. And legally, because we couldn't do Top Gear anymore, but we wanted something that had the same elements, we legally had to change things. And we had, on Top Gear, we had a studio element, which we did indoors. And with this one, we needed another kind of studio thing. Jeremy had seen an episode of True Detective where there was a tent in the, with a sort of religious meeting. And uh, he went, why don't we do that? Why don't we get a tent and then we'll move it around the world and do the show in different countries? And we're like, how much is that going to cost? We haven't got a budget for it. So, and we're going, it could be millions. And he's going, no, it's a great idea. So we go for our first meeting with Amazon and we're in the lift and our lawyer and us are saying to Jeremy, don't mention the tent, don't mention the tent, whatever you do, don't mention the tent. And he's like, no, don't mention the tent. So we go in, we sit down, we're talking with Amazon, there's a silence and this guy goes, you got any ideas? And there's a silence and I'm thinking, no, here it comes because he's going to fill a silence. Yeah, I saw this episode of True Detective, I said, oh, fucking hell. Um, and then it was off and then that, so Amazon bought into that and we had to do it. Yeah. But over the years, yeah, it's all ironed itself out. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about younger audiences uh, a little bit. Yeah. Because, I mean, we look after Volkswagen Group brands, and one of the big challenges we face is how to engage with younger audiences. Um, and there's obviously a really healthy demand for automotive content. I mean, if you think of some of the vloggers out there like Shmi, Mr. JWW, Supercars of London, etc. And we've done some work with James Corden's Carpool Karaoke for yep. Porsche. What advice would you give to car manufacturers trying to engage with younger audiences? Well, I'd say that... Buying a car is a serious purchase. It involves a lot of money and it's not done lightly. And then by definition, the mainstream advertising for the car industry is conservative. Yeah. Traditionally, it's a beautifully photographed, beautiful setting, strap line. That's fine for the conservative mainstream world, but with digital, you should go crazy. You should absolutely go crazy because that's the point of it. And when I see car, adver, car manufacturers making a kind of slightly smaller version of what they do with mainstream on digital, it's bollocks. Just don't do it. It's a waste of time. Yeah. You can have carpool karaoke is the right thing to do for mm. Porsche as an example, because um, everyone knows Porsches drive well. Everyone knows they're built well. There's no point in saying that again. Mm. So you might as well have some fun with the brand and warm it up. Yeah. Um, because every time I see, like, well, can I say names? There was a high Hyundai advert, and it's got all these hipsters, you know, in Barcelona having a great night, and they all look like male models and female models. And they're in this Hyundai, which is a very worthy car, and you think, 
that's just a fantasy in your head, you know, the avatar. That's what you want to happen, but it's never gonna happen, you know? Yeah. So don't go there, have some fun with what digital can be. Yeah. And it can be provocative, it can be like and dislike, whatever you do. But certainly don't use it as a slightly cheaper way of making glossy adverts. Right. Would be my right. mainstream right. thing. Then I think the other thing is, we're aware of it. I mean, we live in a world of car enthusiasts, but we're not daft. We know that I think the issue for the future is going to be to say to young people, not which car do you buy, but do you want a car? Are you going to have a car? Because a lot of young people, I think, are growing up now not like our generation did, which is the car gives me freedom. Yeah. They're growing up with, do I actually need this in my life? So I would say to manufacturers, car, younger people are going to start thinking, do I really need to own all of this car? It sits outside, losing value, and it costs a lot of money. Why bother? Uber is here. Yeah. So they should be going, why don't you buy a quarter of a car? Why don't you have, you know, you do all the sharing, that's got to explode. Right. Because our generation, we are both gray haired. Um, we're on the way out. <laughs> all right, I, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about yeah. technology and how you've used technology to build the Grand Tour. I mean, you have X-Ray on the screen, yes. which, you know, is, is, is kind of great. But I understand there's a new gaming aspect to the third series, which is really exciting. This um, can you tell us about that? I think there's a mental. clip, clip Absol to show. But absolutely mental. There's, yeah. um, basically, there's a video game. There must be every geek in Silicon Valley working on it in their spare time, because I don't know how they're going to do it. But each time an episode comes out, there'll be a video game the next day of that episode. Right. Now, if we... you think of how the speed of it takes to... So at the minute, if we, we take a year to make all our films and cut them and edit them, if I have a rough cut of a film, I send it to them straight away and then they get working on rendering what that's going to be. And then they send photographers out to photograph the tarmac and the bark on a tree so they can get going on their own way on the landscapes and stuff. But they, the, the whole shtick is that you play the game the next day. Right. And it's not going to be deliberately of the level of Forza Gran Turismo. It's aimed more at um, more fun. Th those are like the high end real gearheads who just want to set these amazing lap times. This is more fun. So the sort of resolution is still really good, but it won't be that kind of nerdy, super high pixelation. Okay. It's kind of a little bit less. We, we, still we've good. got a clip, haven't we? Can yeah, we, just, we have. Can, yes, please. let's have a look at that. Yeah, so that's coming soon. Uh, January, I, when the series is out. I, I also wanted to ask you about Drive Tribe, what the sort of thinking was behind Drive, Drive Tribe. Drive Tribe is um, a sites that we have developed and at first we thought right we'll make a website based around Richard James and Jeremy but then we thought no we can do better than that so what it is is like a motoring community where car fans kind of create their own content hence the tribes and then we do our best to kind of curate it um, and then what's really good about it too is the data flow information flow that goes backwards and forwards between manufacturers who want to know what people are thinking. They come to those, those tribes, and then when the manufacturers have got something they want to say, they push that across the tribes, and then they get their feedback too. And if we make, say, a film for Audi, we can cut that into 30 different ways of being released and used and so on. For, because you know that a car magazine is probably, sadly, as a print thing, dying away. So there's got to be other ways of getting the information out there, and Drive Tribe does that. That's the yeah. kind of essence of it. But at the same time, it is this kind of democracy where if somebody likes Formula One, they make a tribe talking about it, and then other people come along. And it can be high-end stuff like that. There's a guy who started a tribe called My Shit First Car, and then everybody who's had a shit first car starts to join in with their... And then you just get that, you get that conversation going, which I love. Okay, well, look, that's fantastic. I think we're out of time, but I just want to say thanks enormously to Andy. I think it's an amazing story of the transition from a traditional format to something which is obviously very large scale and, as you've seen, very future facing. So I just want to say a really big thank you to Andy no, thank you. for joining us today. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you.